Hi, and welcome to the Frank Williams Show. I'm your host, Frank Williams, um, bringing to you a panel of discussions. I have a guest, Mr. James Martin, and our topic of the day is in the trenches. So we want to just start right in with Mr. Martin, man, and let you guys get to hearing some of his story, his background, the things he have done for his community in Bayview Hunters Point and abroad. So James Martin, welcome, James Martin. Thanks, Frank, and I'm, I'm glad to be the first guest on your show. I'm honored. Yes, sir. So tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, the work you've done in the trenches. But let's start with your background. Who, who is James Martin? Oh, man. That, that's, it's maybe not a difficult question, and maybe it's more depth than I know. Uh, but uh, James, James Martin is a product of community and, and family and church and traditional values. And, 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 and those areas are, are you know, those things that, that really build me. And, and I said product of community. Uh, for, well, say, I should say church first because all my grandfathers, I mean, all my, both my grandfathers were Baptist ministers, my uncles. I got preachers all through the family, you know. And uh, um, I am, I, well, I was ordained uh, at, uh, at 21 years old to, to be a minister in the Churches of God in Christ. I'm no longer a traditional minister in that sense, but the work of my life is my ministry. I'm not, I don't have to preach it from someone's pulpit, and most people don't even know that I'm a minister because it's not what you call me. It's what I do that counts in my mind. And, uh, you know, so that, that, that those were where my basic values come from. Um, and then in terms of uh, family, my mom raised seven of us after we came from Detroit, Michigan in 19, 1959. And we came into uh, San Francisco right at uh, Bayview Hunters Point up on the hill. And that was uh, uh, the beginning of you know, um, a whole new life for, for all of us in my family. Uh, my dad was a bus driver in Detroit and was laid off when a lot of bus drivers were laid off because their um, public transit system was shrinking. So they said, if you want to continue to drive the bus, go to San Francisco. And that's what my dad did with a lot of other African-American bus drivers at the time. And um, I was raised uh, up on the hill. Mom kept us all in church. And during the summers is where I got my, kind of got my, uh, the influence that impacted my life that got me more into involved with the communities because I've spent a good deal of my life as a community advocate with a lot of accomplishments that I'm proud of uh, for our, our, our communities, for collective communities across the United States. And um, so those experiences have uh, shaped me as an example. I think one of the best examples uh, I can give in terms of how community works for me and calls me to become the man that I am and that I've been over my career and throughout my life. Um, well, on. Uh, on that note, why don't you tell um, the people um, what is it exactly that you do uh, and tell them some of what you have done and why you called upon within the community today, just so they could be up to date on who James Martin is. Okay. Well, um, what my background is, I, I uh, as a product of the community, I, I came to work in, in, in the telephone company, Pacific Bell. Uh, when I was 18, uh, 19, I think 18 years old. And right out of high school, I, I had, I had a, the opportunity to get there. And uh, um, I, I spent my, my, uh, about 20 years in that environment, but that's where I got my higher education because I didn't, don't have a college degree. Uh, but significantly, uh, and, and in my mind, I've had the opportunity to teach at uh, uh, in a master's program at, at, at uh, one of the local universities here on, in organization development, which is uh, the field that I've practiced in uh, over the past 30 years, working with nonprofit organizations, Fortune 500 companies, large and small, and uh, even with uh, awards and credits, uh, awards and recognitions to my credit, been able to do some significant things. And uh, um, as, the, as I said, the community, has flavored almost all of my life because it was when I was in high school or just getting ready to go to high school, people in the community, a bunch of some of the ladies, very, very powerful women in our community were responsible for helping uh, bringing a whole bunch of kids one summer just before I went to high school down into the Bayview Opera House. 
and said, uh, we're going to, you know, get you guys, we're going to change your life in essence. And, and, and they did exactly that. They got us all there and they sent us out of the community on field trips for the first time in our life to see other responsible African-American people in a business environment, working and doing, and, and, and not just African-American, but other people doing uh, a lot of things. And one of the places I tell the story a lot that I went to, the first one I went to was um, to the phone company on 25th Street, and, and they, they took a bunch of us over there, and uh, the brother came down there because they had always been ha hiring African Americans in management positions, but this brother was a manager, and he came down in his three-piece suit. He spoke the King's English perfectly, and, and he came down, and, and he uh, brought us all in into the, the, the switch room, and we walked into this massive room where there's um, hundreds of thousands of click, 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 going on. He said, now each time you hear one of these clicks, that means someone is picking up their phone. And, and it was just so amazing to all of us. And he was so articulate and he knew everything that was going on. This guy impressed me so much, Frank. And so uh, uh, the first thing I said after I left there, I said, I got to get me one of those suits. Yeah, <laughs> I was impressed with his three-piece suit. But not only that, I said, I want to do what he does. And so throughout, from that point, uh, I began uh, um, my pursuit of, 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 of my dream. And, and I teach that all the time. And in order to, to achieve a dream, I, I teach people that you have to get young people programmed on where they want to be. And you've know, got to get that early. You know, the, the basic question of what do you want to be when you grow up? is a question that should be asked to every young person because it's going to follow them. In that program, uh, the, one of the women that was pushing that program that got us out to those places was uh, um, Ms. Westbrook, mm -hmm. Eloise Westbrook, and many people know Ms. Westbrook. Well, she was, tell them who she is. She's, she's been a, a community uh, um, advocate, and she was a hard worker. She put so many things together over the years. In fact, it was Ms. Westbrook and some of the other women in the community that went to Washington back in, in, in the uh, war on poverty days. Under Lyndon Johnson said, we need more money for our community, for our children. And, for, and, and they were able to pull that down. And so the money started coming. And that's when they brought all these kids together, myself and so many others included. And I got to tell you, without that involvement of, of that woman and those people in our community, those women in our community, I wouldn't be here talking to you now. So, you know, we're talking about a different day and time, and ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about in San Francisco, California here, and um, we're also talking about African Americans in San Francisco, and it was a different time then than it is now. So, and I want I want to touch on a few things you just brought up real quick. Uh, the example that you gave, uh, coming out of high school and you came out of high school and you had a pipeline right into a employment with AT&T and you also talked about some cultural uh, social support that came from the community, some social engagement that came from the community, from working class people who had dignity and pride and, and try to help keep their children and, and neighbors out of, out of trouble situations so they invested in them. They so did. what's the difference between what's going on there and what happened to bring about the, some of the degradation that we're going through and witnessing? For example, now, you know, back around the time you're talking about, who know, I don't even know what the stats is on how many African-Americans was here then. I know up to around 84, it was probably like 11 percent of African-Americans in San Francisco. And you're talking way before the 80s, right? Yeah. And so to now, today, we got 3% of African Americans in San Francisco. So over from the 60s to where we at now, from which you started from to where we at now, the climate has changed a lot. And I would like some of your input on the things that you've seen. Um, why did you see certain mechanisms get taken away that was helping various cultures, not just African American culture, but various cultures, but has highly impacted, has highly impact African American culture, way of life, and living in San Francisco. Well, Frank, and that that that's a lot involved there. But but let me just take that on and, and begin, you know, by saying that the challenges we have today are formidable for for our young people. Um, and and when I say for our young people, that means for the, the, the you know for our community uh, well into the future. Uh, some of the damage that's been done uh, through a, in, a, in a lot of things, a lot of laws and policies that have impacted the way we live. Well, to, to change the, 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 the detrimental 
implications of some of these policies will take many, many generations to come because they've injured so many. For instance, you know, in San Francisco uh, um, alone, um, the stats came out in 2009. Once again, in 2011, they repeated and they hadn't changed. And those are the stats that say in San Francisco, over 2,000 times more African-American children are removed from their homes by services such as CPS. Uh, and, and then in that same article, it's, it says that in San Quentin, goes on to say in San Quentin, um, more than 75% of the inmates at San, in San Quentin have come through the foster care system. And in essence, what that says is, is that, you know, here at one system, one system that has policies of uh, 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 removing children from homes and, 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 and the uh, idea and opinions of some far too readily, far more than they need to, far too easily, and making it far too difficult for parents to reunite with their children. They, they, they get more children out of their families, break up more homes, uh, and without the reunification at a high level, than, in, um, than with African Americans more than anyone else in this, in this city. And that's significant. Uh, we have, yes, we have, you know, when we talk about, I did serve on, on uh, uh, um, as advisor um, to, uh, to the mayor of San Francisco around, uh, Mayor Jordan, around the issues of, of uh, African Americans being, uh, be leaving San Francisco, the unfinished agenda I consulted for the mayor. And, but, and one of the things we, we looked at, what are the policies? and, and, and uh, the implications that come from all different directions that push this forward. And uh, there are so many different things. There, there, there are the policies, everything from how easily it, 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 take, it is for, to get your car towed and how much money for someone who doesn't have a lot of money to get their car back in, 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 in an environment that you, where you, you need all automobile transportation for some of the even smallest things. So, I mean, when you push people out of the, the ability to have the basic needs of their life because they become so unaffordable that they can't be sustained without them, then, then that's helping to push people out. And so we've seen a, a, a lot of things, and we, as you say, we've seen a population drop. Uh, we've seen uh, in, in popular culture, even how we describe our neighborhoods. We've heard uh, references you know, where we used to call it the, the, the neighborhood indeed, uh, and today we call it the hood. Uh, and and part, part of that is because of the high preponderance of men going, men and women going in to the uh, institutions being incarcerated for a short or long period of time, but on an ongoing basis and repeatedly. What that does is, is causes the change of culture and the way that men and women think about one another. Because you go into the, that institution, you stay there for a while, you begin to learn the ways that people live in that institution because there's a different culture when in prison than there is in the, in the local neighborhood. There's a different level of trust. There's a different level of, uh, of, of how we perceive and interact with each other. There's a different level of civility. But when you have hundreds of thousands of your residents going into that institution and, and, and being reculturized, then they come back out with a whole different attitude and they come out uh, influencing uh, younger brothers and sisters. Uh, they come out marrying into your family and my family and just being a part of the community, bringing the values that came from inside the institution back out to make them become the primary values because of the numbers, primary values in the neighborhoods where we live. And so that's okay, created so a, a I shift. Want, I want you to hold that thought for a minute. Sure. Because you also covered some ground here that led from, um, that led from, whereas there was where doors open and there was more community uh, outreach there was more even community leadership to where you even mentioned mrs westbrook for example who helped pay the way for even housing being developed in san francisco but going back to even your upbringing and whereas you had a mentor you had mentors and social models you've seen the guy wearing a three-piece suit at at&t next you know coming out of high school you end up working it became a goal for you you end up working at at&t right you know whereas Today, you walk outside your, or in recent years, you will walk outside your door 
in those neighborhoods, meaning those neighborhoods like District 10, for example, or District 5, right? And you and you walk out, out your door and next thing you know, you see drug dealers and everything else, right? So there was a big cultural shift in what it what was being demonstrated for us that was being like uh, these messages given to us that instilled us to, hey, there's another way to make money, there's another way to live, there's another way to do without, because what I mean by do without, because these jobs just not happening for African Americans in San Francisco. And the other great change that also came apart between the era that you're speaking of to where we at today, you didn't have major during the Reagan era, you didn't have all types of manufacturers and whatnot shipped overseas. Well, where now those Coca-Cola companies and you know these different Levi Strauss companies, et cetera, Del Monte's is all overseas in third world countries where they where they working for ten dollars a, a week, right? Where maybe our grandparents was making thirty, forty dollars an hour as a foreman and was was having single homes and was married and sending their children to school, all got eliminated. So what was left? Next, you know, we was pushed into a technology era, mm -hmm. right? Where we weren't even trained to do data processing and data entry and didn't really know anything about computers. So the jobs that was left open out there for us was to work in a safe way or something like that. You know what I mean? To yeah. be a cashier, right? Bag up some groceries that put additional stress on our families as far as causing those splits. That caused where I'm going with that. That's why so many kids ended up in foster care, right? Parents wasn't even, they self-esteem and dropped. They unemployed. They not working. They can't take care of their children, right? And then you got other people dumping, telling that this child is being neglected or being abandoned. So then here comes CPS. Um, and there go some of the reasons for some of these children being put in the system as well and at a great rate. Mm -hmm. But what's so different now? See, this is I I want to I want to really dive into this thing like in San Francisco, right? We seeing a great divide between the haves and the have-nots now. Yes. Middle class is pretty much being wiped out of San Francisco. And it's been going in in durations, right? It's been leading up to where we at today. Mm -hmm. So where we at today with just 3% of African Americans in San Francisco, just 3%, right? When just last year, it was 6%. We down to 3%, right? So where do our children, where's the pipeline for our children coming out of high school? Right here in San Francisco, one of the richest cities in the world, if not the richest city in, in the United States. Right, where children don't even have a pipeline to employment, but they have a pipeline to prisons. So going into what you was talking about, the prison and learning that culture, why did this pipeline take place? You know, there, there are a lot of reasons uh, um, in a sociological sense. Um, but if I got right down to it from, from my perspective, and my perspective covers, you know, I've, I've, I've Done thing worked internationally on a lot of different levels. I've, I've worked in the prisons in Los Angeles in jails and, and here in San Francisco. We worked to correct a lot of issues in the prison, uh, but some of it goes. When you say we. Well, a part of the time, a good part of that time, I was regional director for the Western Region of the NAACP. Uh, that means I, I had, uh, in that context, I, I had responsibility uh, for um, over 150 branches through nine Western states. Uh, and I, I went from city to city, and, and, and I looked at the issues of my people in the, in, in the various branches throughout the, the Western United States and, and through other parts as I would travel. We're, we're, we're dealing with issues that were very you know, similar. I mean, in some places, the issues come up, for instance, drugs and gang behavior and, and some of the, the, the more negative issues that have a deleterious impact on, on, on our, our community and on our young people. They, they were, it was showing up the same way like cookie cutters. And it was hard for me to deny in my mind anyway that, you know, this is just not all happening by mistake. 
you know, so, you know, there, there, there are some things that happen beyond, be behind the scenes, you know, that we don't know, we're not always aware of, and, and sometimes even when some of those, uh, the, the very uh, wise people, insightful people, uh, pull the cover off of some of the ugliness that's going on undercover, then we still don't react. And to me, that's been a major part of the problem, a lack of, while, while we tend to be reactionary, we don't go ahead of the game, and we, we, don't, we don't, as far as I know, there is no collective strategic plan for developing the future, a positive future for our children. You know, and, and there's no strategic plan because there are, that's, that's not to say there's nothing being done, but there's nothing being done in a, in a real collective fashion. And when everybody in the world, you know, and, and the world that we're talking about, we, we go off and try to resolve this, I go off and, and I don't need Frank, and Frank doesn't need, you know, we, we're all moving our own directions. But so seldom do we come together to develop strategic plans uh, um, forward with a common level of thinking that we we're so, we don't we dissipate our own strength. Well, you know, I mean, that's just that's, one that's, of those areas. That's a good. That's yeah. Well, that's a good area you brought up that that need to be chimed in on, right? Because the simple reason that there's a lot of think tanks in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of African American think tanks in San Francisco. There's quite a few great leaders, and there's quite a few good leaders, and then there's those who go along with the status quo, yeah. right? Let's just keep it 100, yeah. right? Because that's what this show about keeping it 100. That's real. So we're not here to put on a show for the show. Mm -hmm. We're here to tell the truth, right? Yeah. And so we have we have a mixture, right? But there's there's been plenty of plans of how to keep us stabilize and sustain the African-American culture. But just as we work to sustain the African-American culture, just as other cultures here, your uh, yes. Hispanic culture, your Asian culture, they seek to sustain themselves as well. Am I correct? Yeah, you're you right. You know what you're I mean? Right. But ours is lacking when it comes to economical development. Ours is lacking when it comes to... Um, those people that are at the head of the field that can make things happen for communities, such as the people that you vote for, that you put in the office to carry out tasks for you, you know, and some do good and some don't. The, the, the disparity is, the disparity that's often overlooked when we even vote, say for a board of supervisor, mm -hmm. right? If district chair vote for a board of supervisors, that one person gonna win even if 12 run. And same all across the other districts, Correct. Yeah. But when they go into a session to work on issues and policies and vote on certain issues and policy to come across a desk, there has to be like a majority of a vote for that process, doing that process in order for that bill of policy to be approved. Right. Mm -hmm. Or to be moved to the next level. And so what I'm, what I'm bringing that up is to say that is to get to this point is that. You know, some people take a lot of hits for others by being called sellouts, by uh, saying they haven't really done that much, not understanding they take more than one vote, right? But at the same time, what are we doing? Are we looking for a savior out here? Are we looking for somebody to say, well, I believe in you, James Martin. I know you would get us there. What are we doing as far as educating ourselves to understand there's more than one way to achieve your objective and to achieve it correctly. Because I'm not seeing like the elimination of, you know, like today, right? You got Black Lives Matters and all mm -hmm. these different marches, but are marches as effective as they used to be? You know, I would like to think that the pen is way more effective, but that's, but you need more than one strategy. So exactly. when we talk about strat strategizing, what do you see some of the things that we need to do to put in place? Because right now in San Francisco, sad to say, it's turned into a single society. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it really has in terms of, you know, but what, what are we doing? What, what can we do? As you said, there are a lot of people doing a lot of wonderful things. Uh, but the, 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 and, and that is on one level, the, 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 the way to resolve the issues, and, and, and then on another level, that is the problem. Because there's so many people doing their individual thing that they, they rarely come together. You know, in, in, the, in a strategy, you, you take a look at, 
Let's talk about it in a military sense, if you, if you don't mind. If you take a look at a military strategy, you have the infantry, you've got, you know, uh, different uh, commands within the infantry doing different things uh, and moving in different directions. All, but everybody knows the role that they have to play because they've, they've come together. One place they've been in a strategic setting and, and, and someone has assigned the different roles that each person has to play. In our community, I decide what role I will have to play, and it doesn't matter if I work with anybody else or not. We have allowed a, a whole sense, you say a single society, you could take that in, very, in, in various ways because a single-minded, excuse me, society is, is, it seems to be the one where I think that I have all the answers. And I will dictate, you know, you know, for those little people that, that listen to me. And then you have people who go around and say, well, you know, there's no need for a, you know, we don't need leaders today. We don't need another Martin Luther King. Everybody is their own leader. You know, and, and in my mind, sometimes that kind of voice goes out just to separate people, keep people from coming together. Because we do need leadership. What, what group of people has ever been able to win anything for a, a, a worthy cause without having some framework of leadership? We've got to take a look at what does leadership look like for us and what roles must leadership play in the context. And then when, when we talk about what roles must leadership play, we've got to say, okay, so what is the agenda? Can we outline clearly what is the agenda so that we all can think along the same line? That doesn't mean we won't have disagreements and we won't have arguments, but we can come together and begin to think around what is the common goal. Let's be real clear about our common goal. Let's be real clear about some timelines that we, we want to achieve something. Let's be real clear about the consequences if we don't do anything, if we don't come together, and if we continue to move in this way. So to be able to think in a much broader sense, it, Frank, in, 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 in my career, I, I, I've been blessed to be able to do some significant things. I, uh, you know, in, in terms of economic development, over, over the years I've, uh, I've worked with helping to bring deals, uh, believe it or not, together in excess of uh, $5 billion that have had impacts on, 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 on the people for, from minority vendors from different industries. And, I, you know, I've consulted along these lines for Fortune 500 companies uh, for, for local governments and for international governments. But we put a lot together. But the problem is that once there are some opportunities that are cultivated and, and, and developed, we don't have the mechanisms and leadership to help implement those ideas. You and know, that's a challenge. I, I, I don't want to disagree. Okay. I think we do have the mechanisms. I think we do have the leadership. I think, I think what the problem is is that we've entered into the realm of individuality, and I think that that's become, has become part of the paradigm. And if you want to live in an individualistic society, you're going to have individualistic ideas. So what I'm saying is that five of us in the same room could be working on the same common goal, but because of my ego and where I want to go or where I'm told to go, I'm not willing to budge any further than that. So where it comes down to us sitting down, we go through the formalities and how the discussions and the town hall meetings and all mm -hmm. of that, which is all psychological playgrounds just to keep the mass, of pa uh, the mass people pacified, right? Yeah. When decisions already been made on what it's gonna be, be about. And so you may be one of the ones that, well, let's put it to a vote and I vote this, and that person say, I vote this, but the other three say I'm not voting that way because those three are more on the same common ground than the whole five as a total. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so somebody's getting left out. And what I mean by somebody getting left out is this, is that we can have the plans, but some people have to be willing to stick to those plans. And some are not willing to stick to the plans when they have something to lose. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And that one person, man, I always say it like this. I always say it like this. It's like, and I'm going to use this. It's like going to a funeral. You see that person laying there, but you look behind you, right? And it may be hundreds of people or 50 or more people there for that person because of <coughs> all the lives that that person touched, mm -hmm. though. But that's how much power that person have. And each one of us have that type of power. See, so there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to get together and really map out and take this to, to the powers that be. I mean, when we think about this, because I'm going back into something else that you brought up as well, right? The prison system. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I'm going to keep it in San Francisco for right now. So 3% of African Americans in San Francisco, right, we're 56% incarcerated. But keeping that in San Francisco, it's like that all across the United States. Yes, it is. Still today in 2015. So Why is that? I don't think I don't think you're really disagreeing with. Me. I think we're saying the same thing. Okay. Uh, I, because I, 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 what you're saying is, you know, some people are sit, sitting there, but but we're still not coming together. You know, to, to to look at things as 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 we need to, and to plot a course. You said some people disagree with the plan and won't follow the plan, but that's that's in terms. There there is a concept we use for the toward the some of the sex successes we saw in the '60s, and it's simply called community organizing. Mm -hmm. We don't do that effectively anymore. Uh, the, you know, to organize community because, uh, you know, some t somehow or another, politics have become the guiding force of, of, of where we're going. Not even moral values as strongly as, as we used to see it, in my opinion. You know, you know it, 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 it's about is it right politically? Not is it right, you know, in a moral sense for our children? Is it right? Does it serve the politics of the moment? But the politics of the moment will not create the, the promise of the future. Well, you know... You touched it there. And you know what? We run it out of time, too. <laughs> no. And, you know, it's good having you here. And these type of discussions need to be held, you know. And that's another reason why. Why the Frank Williams show? <laughs> because Frank has the courage to pull up the issues and have them discuss and bring yeah. the right people on. Because the people that's going to be on this panel are going to be people that work in the trenches, just like you, James Martin former regional director in NAACP, also worked in the San Francisco County jails, teaching inmates personal development, how to turn their lives around, worked at uh, uh, YMCA, working with, with, with uh, men, working with men, teaching them how to be fathers to their children, and working with the children. So led great marches, uh, one of the first to like, grab your child on the first day of school, I wanna see men. Walking their yeah. babies to school, man. You know, I really applaud you. Also a, a recipient of the In the Trenches Awards, among many other awards. You know, I remember seeing a picture with you with President Bush, the daddy, yeah. sitting in the White House at the round table when you was president of NAACP. So, you know, we don't have enough time to cover all your accolades, but I just want to commend you, and I want to thank you for being on our show and for giving the listeners listeners a little bit but letting them know who you are you know a little more letting our viewers know who you are and so that i can let them know that this guy here james martin he works in the trenches thank you frank thanks for letting me be here well we appreciate you being here so that's it for our show t tonight ladies and gentlemen i am frank williams your host and our guest for the day was james martin uh, former director in NAACP. He is a consultant. Uh, he do great work in San Francisco. And we're going to have more hot topics to talk about. And all our topics going to be working. It's going to be twisted around in the trenches because those that work in the trenches are the ones that we want on this show. Can I come back sometime? Sure. And we'd love to have you okay, back, James. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to keep it going. We'd love to have you back here. Good. And, thank uh, you. Thank you for being Good. here. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Open my mind with the truth. Now I'm gonna live.